Good morning. How is everyone? Good. Welcome to the Dallas Book Festival and the Dallas Public Library. I'm Stephanie Bennett, your host, and I'm also the manager of this floor. Um, and we are excited to welcome you to our event today, Writing Your Family History for Others. Um, this came about because as a family history researcher, I've tried showing family members my online trees that I've researched. And I've watched slowly as their eyes start to glaze over <laughs> and um, they try and stay interested, but very gradually their eyes stray away. And um, I'm sure it may be a problem that many of us face. Um, so the question is, what are different ways that we can engage other people um, with our family history? And luckily for us, we have three wonderful authors here to tell us how they succeeded. First up today, we have Ed Millis here to tell us about organizing family letters into a book. Ed is a native Dallasite and a retired Texas Instruments engineer. Ed has authored over 16 books, including several books of his family letters, which he will now tell us about um, putting together. Let's have it for Ed. Perfect while well, I get organized here. <laughs> or is it too late for that? <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. That was, uh, that was very nice. Uh, I, I'm going to talk about how to make a book out of a collection of family letters. Is that loud enough? It? However, I'm not going to speak to you today at all. In fact, I'm going to read to you instead, and uh, I can guarantee you that it's a better choice, especially since I've got this new big print version of it here. <laughs> <laughs> as long as I don't lose my place. Uh, well, the very best thing to inherit may be a lot of money, but a close second is a collection of family letters, and I did inherit just that. It is the letters of the Gavin Drummond Hunt family of Lexington, Kentucky. A book of family letters is a great way to use the new cliche of putting meat on the bones of your genealogy, I guarantee you. I'm going to briefly show you a kind of a system that my daughter Bev Haskin, who is living in Massachusetts, uh, uh, and I worked on. By the way, my other daughter, Susan, is Millis is on the front row here, so I got the audience. <laughs> and uh, she and I have used uh, this system to make two such books, and maybe if you've got any, any letters, this will give you an idea on how to, how to do more of them. Can I have the first slide, please? Can we have the first slide? Yes. I just have to see if it's There we go. That is a package that I found this last year. I put one more, one more bunch of family letters that I knew nothing about that showed up in my stuff. Anyway, and that, that one has about uh, 30 letters and most of the envelopes in it. I guess I'm going to have to go do that one one of these days, too. <laughs> Let me walk you through the system that Bev and I used. The first step is to get the letters prepared for making a book. They need to be sorted by date identified by writer, and then archivally stored in a plastic sleeve marked with an identification code. Uh, do not mark on the letters themselves. I wish my mother had known that in the 40s. <laughs> the first, uh, begin the letter sorting by buying enough of these archival polypropylene open-ended sleeves, which, are, which are, only cost about a dime a piece, I think. The polypropylene is... is works quite well for this level of archival stuff. This one's like three by six, but get a big enough where you can slip a, slip a sleeve and, and a folded letter in it. Uh, you can also search archival sleeves on the internet to find people who sell them if you need to buy some. Also, in an office supply, get a package of the adhesive address labels that are very common. You, you can't write on the plastic sleeve, but you can write on an address label that you put on there. So that's kind of the fundamental stuff that's uh, Struggle with. Right. Revert to your childhood and go wash your hands because that's the, like you do here in the library, as a matter of fact, for handling old books. They don't use rubber gloves anymore. And, uh, and 
the same is true for handling old letters, so wash your hands good. Then gather up all the letters and the envelopes. Open each of the letters to see if all the pages are there and that they match the envelope if it's available. I've seen a lot of letters in the wrong envelopes with missing pages and pages from wrong letters. Take your time and see if you can find the right places for all these lonesome pages and envelopes. It's good to get it all sorted out ahead of time. Then refold each letter like you found it, slip it into an archival sleeve alongside its envelope. Do not put it back in the envelope, that doesn't do any good except take a chance of tearing something. And write your new secret identification on the sleeve as to what, what that letter is. Example of a, of a, a code like we used is, is, is pretty simple. A, a letter written by Allie Hunt to Mary Craig on August 24th, 1856 that's a whole lot to write, would be turned into the, the identification as 26-8-24 alley Mary, And that gives you all the information you need to identify that letter. And if you will give me the second slide, please. Uh, this, is, this is one that was actually used uh, uh, on the, making the book. Uh, if there's no date on the letter or envelope, just put an X in the date field. Later, you'll probably be able to make a pretty good guess uh, at the date from the context of the letter or possibly matching its content with other letters. It doesn't have to be an exact date anyway. You want to roughly in, in time order. And if you can't figure out which one you know, it is, uh, neither can anybody else. So go wash your hands again. Uh, you're going to now start scanning the letters and uh, you do need a scanner to do this project open up a big computer file called say family letters and uh, this will collect all the letter scans and later the transcriptions of them and this big file is now going to be going to accept one new folder for every new letter every letter is going to have a folder with its stuff in it but wash your hands again take the oldest letter out of the sleeve to your scanner and scan every side of every page that has an ink mark on it, just about. And probably the front of the envelope, too. The envelope has got interesting information that you may need to look up. Rather than have to go back and dig it out, you just, just go ahead and scan the front of the envelope. By the way, we use 300 DPI for all of our scannings, and that worked out just fine. It was plenty tight enough to, to get all, of, all the resolution we needed. If the letters are dark or faded, you know, and of course they're going to be, uh, or otherwise difficult to read. Use Photoshop or the equivalent to adjust the scan's contrast and brightness. Is the only two you need to mess with. We've tried a lot of stuff. Occasionally, if you convert them to black and white first, that, that helps sometimes too. But it's almost like magic. You can take what looks like a, a page with nothing on it just about and bring it up. And I'll show you one in a second here. So then you, uh, after doing this and, and correcting, uh, correcting them uh, images, you save that in the family letters folder. So repeat the scanning and correcting until you're either really tired of it or you run out of letters, whichever comes first. <laughs> now the fun starts. You're going to get to transcribe the letters using these improved scanned images. Don't try to use the original letters to read from the, the ones you have done and done the assisting the uh, readability on the, the next slide please the 3A drama letter yeah, uh, this letter was written with a pencil on tablet paper if, if that's the one that looks like a blank piece of paper that's the one I want to show <laughs> yeah. that thing is, it, and do you know why it's wrinkled and folded like that faded like that because it's been folded for 150 years <laughs> <laughs> It's been there a long time. It really, was really not readable. And uh, if you'll go to slide 3B, please. Oh, wow. Here's after putting the magic on it with the Photoshop or, mm -hmm. or, or the equivalent. Or, actually, I think Word, Word has a way to do that on, on pictures, too, to some, to some version of Word. But anyway, it looks nice. Let me show you what it, what it looks like. The next slide uh, is, a, is a piece that clipped out of the top of it that says, My dear Paul. And this is Drummond, Drummond writing and, uh, to his father. And let me read you a little from this letter. This letter was written in se uh, September the 23rd, uh, 
1863 from Drummond to his father. I've selected a few items here. He says, the enemy is on our front in heavy force and battle expects to commence momentarily. We can see the enemy's columns very plainly with the naked eye. Uh, he, enter, he closes the letter by saying, love to all, haste, in haste. Imagine that, in haste. They're ready to really shoot at him. Your affectionate son, Drummond, and then he was at the Battle of Chickamauga, which was one of the worst battles of the Civil War. And that is a real battlefield letter. Well, here's the fun part of transcribing. You finally get to read the letters. And, uh, I suggest using your computer in a, in a split screen mode, which I was not that familiar with, uh, and my daughter Barry was. <laughs> Excuse me. Have you done split screens where you can put them side by side? And could, did you know you could put them one above the other? This I didn't know. This is some version of Word. If you can get one above the other, the top one you put the scan of the original letter on the top of this, you can move it up and down and zoom in and out. The bottom one is your blank piece of paper that you're transcribing to. You sit there and look at the upper screen and type it into the lower screen. That works really, really well and saves a lot of time. We've tried all kinds of ways to that work. I have since forgotten how you make your computer do that, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to worry about it. When you finish transcribing the letter and putting its, don't forget to put its identification number on it, print a paper copy of it uh, for your three ring binder that you're going to get because you really need paper copies of all the transcriptions. And then of course you can do put, save the transcription into the family family letters file also with the other, with the letters scanned. And indecipherable words, which comes up a lot in this sort of thing, and I guarantee there will be somewhere between a few and a lot of words that you can't make out at first. If you give up on one, and I'm sure you will, mark it on your transcription page with a question mark or something so you can come back to it later and work on it again maybe. When it's convenient to have two people, which is what I had with daughter Bev, uh, two people involved in transcribing works wonderful. When one person can't read, the other person can, to, to a large extent, and vice versa. And we ended up playing a game about some of the words as to who, who could figure out what the hell that was. <laughs> but that was a, that was a worked out really well. Particularly, Bev learned to read these young young ladies things that I could make either head or tail of. She doesn't read it read it in sight. It's a, whatever whatever gene was, I didn't have it. But, <laughs> it's it's kind of like editing. You, you can't do your own work or something. Mm -hmm. Now the uh, number four drum and crisscross is uh, on there. Every now and then you'll find one of these. We found a lot of these. As a matter of fact, it's a really this is fairly rare now. This this is called crisscross letter. And what it is, uh, very is very common with soldiers. Although we had them done by everybody one time or another, because soldiers never quite had enough writing paper. Can you, you can see what you did? He did apparently four pages uh, of, the, of, the, of a folded letter, but had more to say, so he turned the, turned the page sideways and, and wrote across the top of, of one of the letters. And it's really not that bad. It's remarkable. You look at that, it looks like it's terrible. And if you'll go to the next slide, I'll show you how terrible it is. Well, maybe it is terrible. That's what, you, that's what you're looking at. <laughs> but the eye tends to follow on the roll and, and disregard the noise. And it's, it's kind of like magic doing that, too. So it's not to bend there. And I think they're kind of pretty. They're, they're kind of a, like magic almost. Well, I'm not going to tell you how to design a book to put the letters in. That's somebody else's job, or maybe you already know. But let's talk about the stuff that's different than a regular book. Here's what you're working towards. This is slide number eight. And this is a, a pair of pages from Kiss Willie, which was the first book that we, we wrote. We were not uh, making any effort to save paper on the layout, so consequently we put the letters in. Every, every new letter started at the top of a fresh page. It, it, it's very easy to do and keep track of, and it, doesn't use, it uses up more paper, but paper is cheap. But that's what our first book looked like. And um, slide nine, please, is on there. That is pages, a uh, pair of pages from my dearest sister. This is the second book that we wrote, and it was a great deal of effort to try and save paper on that one. And these letters follow each other, just kind of nose to tail. If you, when you finish the letter, step down a little bit, drew a line, start the next letter. It, it's easy to read and more difficult to do, but it worked out, and it also saved a bunch of paper. 
So begin writing your begin writing your book, uh, starting with the transcribed letters. Begin with the oldest, of course, and, and keep them in date order. And it's normal to find a letter or two with the wrong date, so you'll have to move it. So no big deal. Next chore we think is very important is that you need to annotate the letters or add comments to the letters. It adds a whole lot to the interest of the book. The letters are from a different world, as we know, and you need to explain that to the reader somehow. Google will may become your best friend if you're not careful. Anytime something in a letter is puzzling or interesting to you, it'll be even more puzzling or interesting to the reader. And a bit of explanation will do wonders in making the book interesting as well as enlightening for some. My daughter, Bev, really liked doing the annotation and finally taught me out of letting her do them all. She liked to dig up the answers to these strange questions that we found. In fact, we had a couple of occasions, there was, we mentioned a, some rare hotel they had been to. She jumped online, found a picture of the hotel, mm -hmm. stuck it in there. So we, 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 there's another source of stuff that you can fill in some holes with. I'll let you figure out what front matter you want to put in the book. So the people who are not writers using the buzzword of the front matter. Front matter is everything but, but the main book. And the, and the front matter is like frontispiece, title page, dedications, tables of contents, indexes, all the peripheral stuff uh, is called front matter. And there's a few special things you might want to add, such as biographies of the main characters. I think it's kind of important to know who's, who's writing the letters. Certainly a, a genealogy chart of some kind. My best suggestion on that is to call Shirley and get her to do it for you. <laughs> she, she did both of mine for I, She didn't do a small one here about that thick, but anyway, keep, keep her in mind. How about a how about a chapter starting a, in your book telling how the how, where you got the story? So where did the where did the letters come from? Where have they been hiding for the last hundred years or hundred and fifty years? And how came you came to write this book? No rules. This is no rules. You just put in anything that you really like to have. Well, now it's time to get it printed and bound. And I know nothing about the modern day internet bookmaking, but I've seen some nice looking books uh, that are reasonable price. I certainly recommend you all take a look at that. I'm I'm way too old for that. Too. <laughs> I've, uh, I've always I've always done it myself, or had it done. And my favorite local for paperback <laughs> books uh, is, is Mike and Tom at the Minuteman Press on Greenville Avenue near Park Lane. Anybody ever deal with that? They are really really good. It's a pleasure to do business with them. And the slide ten, the last slide, and no no cheering, please. <laughs> this is the uh, a page open in the. My dearest sister is showing the frontispiece and obviously the title page there. Uh, the Hunt family is on the left hand page, and in the lower right corner is Willie Craig. And that is my grandfather. He was born in 1860, and according to my mathematics, if he's my grandfather, I'm 112 years old. <laughs> anyway, but he really was. My grandfather was born before the Civil War. Does that make sense to anybody? I hope not. <laughs> Well, let me brag a little on the two books of letters that my daughter and I have done. And both books have the letters from the Drummond Hunt senior family of Lexington, Kentucky. The first book, to Kiss Willie for Me, is a subset of the letters. It was just some, I won't go into detail, it's just, just some Civil War letters. And it, it's a, this is Kiss Willie for Me. And it is a, uh, 180, 187 of the, of the, of the final letters. And my other book, my, my dearest sister, the second book, is all of the letters from that family. We made a special effort to go around the United States. We found a lot of letters that we, we knew where they were hidden. So I think we got just about every letter written. Wow. This, is our, this is our little book. Uh, it's uh, 703 letters, uh, 1856 to 1880, 1,076 pages, and here's the one I like, 550,000 words. <laughs> that is three and a half years and two people who are really tired of it. 
you know, I've made a, a cursory look for similar books and only found one book of Civil War family letters that I think was about 130 letters or something like that. We may have one of the larger collections of letters from non-famous people in this, uh, this book. But it really tells a rare story of life during a dreadful time, both from the battlefield and from the home front. You get them from both sides with the letters, because the letters went both ways. And it was as much interesting going on at home as it was on the battlefield in some ways. The Drummond Hunt Sr. family had five children, four boys and one girl. Uh, the girl was Mary, and she's the one that began the letter collecting uh, when she was being courted, as a matter of fact, in 1856. 1856. The four boys went off to war, and like as many of the split states, two fought on the north and two fought on the south. Ma and Paul were serious Union supporters, which made them less than popularity figures in the, in the town. There's a lot of problems with that. But you get both stories. You get the, you get the, the family story, and you get the home story, and the, the war story. You also get the story of the family being broken up and the loss of her favorite son, Drummond Jr. He was killed in the Battle of Missionary Ridge. But the final part of the story was it really tells the strength of the family. Uh, after the war, they, they got back together, kissed and made up, and became a family again. And, uh, by the way, I carried the biographies of the Hunts to the ends of their families, not to the end of the book. And that's how they ended up in Young County, in Graham, Texas, where my mother was born. So that's how they got to Texas. One last comment about working with a large collection of family letters. Maybe nobody else is going to do this, but, but, but I had a, a, a kind of an interesting experience. It unique fits, fits here, I think. You'll find by the time you're through working with and reading the letters about five times each, you will become a certified member of the family. <laughs> <laughs> and I guarantee you will be emotionally attached like you lived with, lived with them for years. And I'll admit I, I shed a few tears. <laughs> Punchline of this week, and this is from Shirley Slope, uh, the, the DGS speaker some months or years ago uh, was talking about putting the meat on the bones, of course, like we all do. He ended his talk by asking the audience, how many people would like to have a handwritten letter from a grandmother or grandfather? And lots of hands raised. <laughs> he says, well, since a lot of you look like grandparents, get started writing those letters. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Can I ask a question, please? No. Okay. <laughs> no, I, don't, no, I don't know. Speak to her. Uh, we'll do um, questions at the end, a Q&A okay, at the end. Okay. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, next up, we have uh, Miss Shirley Slope. Uh, Shirley is um, one of our longtime genealogy researchers and volunteers um, here at the library and is a longtime member of the Dallas Genealogical Society. She literally wrote the book um, that we use um, for Dallas County Records here at the library. Uh, most recently, um, Shirley was the editor of Estelle Mitchell Adams' book, Remembering Negro Life in Wheelock, Texas. And Shirley has been recognized at numerous times for her outstanding service and commitment to preservation, including the um, 2008 AC Green Award from the Friends of the Dallas Public Library, uh, two uh, Dallas Public Library Certificates of Excellence, two Dallas Genealogical Society Heritage Presentation Awards, two uh, Dallas Genealogical Society Writing Awards, and uh, the 2008 DGS Award of Marriott. Um, Shirley is going to talk to us today about writing narratives use, using social history content. Can you hear me with my voice and the microphone? 
Now, I've salted the audience too. Start. My daughter Laura Martin is here from uh, Austin, <laughs> so we've got at least two people with blackboards. <laughs> anyway, good morning to all of you. This is a nice crowd. I didn't realize how many were here and were delighted to be here to share this morning with us. So, so my background is that I've been enthusiastically involved in doing family research since taking early retirement from the computer industry in 1993. As far as I knew at that time, I had no magic pool of family documents, but since then I've traced almost all my family lines to a satisfactory conclusion. In addition, I've tracked my late husband's slot line of hardworking, very technical German men from Germany to Hamilton, Ohio, a town in Butler County, which is very close to the Western College for Women in Oxford, Ohio, where in 1952 I had a life-changing full-ride scholarship and also met my husband to be Greg Slope. Mm -hmm. So an only child, my husband Greg, and thus I, came into possession of several artifacts and photographs and letters sent to and from Slope family members. Greg died in 1991, much too young, and so missed the family researching thrills I'm now experiencing, and now want to share not only with my children, but with the remaining Slope family members. When I began creating this family timeline for Greg's great-grandfather, F.J.J. Sloat, in October of 2017, there were two of his four Sloat grandchildren still living, Diana and Susan. My goal was to finish the research and share it with both of them, as well as with all the known lineal descendants of F.J.J. Well, life got in the way. With me and the timeline is still in draft mode but it now contains almost 120 pages of events that show how our family members really lived. Susan died this year, but relished reading details as they were discovered, and Diana has contributed several family stories from her staff of memories. Okay, so there's a new approach now that I'm trying. So I've been chasing family records for 26 years, and in March of 2017, the Dallas Genealogical Society hosted a splendid nationally known speaker, Tom Jones, who emphasized a new approach to family research. He asked the audience how many of us have written our own life story, stressing that each of us is the only person who can tell that story, and that we who are here now have experienced life changes of great magnitude about which very few of our descendants will know unless we tell it. And he also dangled the idea of accessing newspapers for clues. Well, to tell the truth, I was losing some enthusiasm for adding names to a pedigree chart that went far in effect that the data often included only names, dates, and places, without much meat on the bones. So, newly inspired, I began to create little two or three page records about things that were significant in my own life, dropping them into a file folder. However, like Pinocchio, Going to school, I strayed from the path of telling my own story and instead, a couple months later, began to investigate the Slope family, justifying this not only because I'd already spent some time tracing them back to the immigration to Germany in 1853, but because I had some very exciting and unusual physical objects in my home that made me suspect that the Slope men might be adventurers and risk takers. So the artifacts included stock certificates issued in 1904 to a John Binder and in 1911 to F.J.J. Sloat for California properties, including the Mountaineer Gold Mine in Nevada City, California. Even more interesting were three gold nugget items, along with a large number of engineering diagrams associated with the interior of the Mountaineer Mine. So can we see the gold items? Because it can count to three. And, uh, and it, uh, the, the one you're looking at, which is the famous gold bra, it, uh, I do not know who did it. It's very delicately done, and it had to be one of the slow men, but I have no idea who would have done that. But additionally, there were stories that my father-in-law, Joe Slope, son of FJJ and Matilda Slope, told to my children about pirate gold being buried in various swampy areas of the intercoastal canal, which the Slope Dredging Company dredged and maintained for many years. And to add to this, we have a sword that is said to have belonged to one of Jean Lafitte's men. So you can leave that on top of a little bit. The data sources that I had and went to were newspapers. I'm really talking vaguely today about using newspapers to tie together some of the other things that you have. 
language. So newspapers and letters, photographs, artifacts, family stories, and public documents. And it's important to stress that the bulk of my talk today emphasizes the value to me of newspaper articles that augment and make sense out of the various inherited letters and photographs that I've And uh, the newspaper articles actually provide a more complete picture of the key families' lives by understanding how they intertwine. So as you look at the timeline elements the way I'm doing, the final thing I'm going to produce, you will you look at the elements chronologically as they were published, which ties together. And you look at one side and you're seeing the date that was published. You see the newspaper and the issue and how to get to that, which are your full sources. And then you've got the article in there as closely as it resembled as it was in the newspaper. So what you're doing is unconsciously catching the time line and the locality while you're looking at the, the uh, what I call it, the, the meat on the bones, that's what you're doing, and learning about your family. So uh, as you do that, there'll be no necessary separate footnotes or endnotes. You're, you're, if you do it right, if I've done it right, you're going to absorb it all and you'll get what was going on in the families and you'll find out how they're living. So, okay. so where to start? Well, the challenge was to understand how it was possible the FTJ Sloat family lived normal lives in a small, quiet town of Hamilton, Ohio, and also participate in gold mining activities in California. <coughs> Obvious candidates to investigate include Frank Joseph J. Sloat, and we're kind of he's FJJ from here on during this talk, and his wife, Matilda Vendersloat, plus their two children, John Gregory and Joseph J. Sloat. I never met FJJ, but I do and love Matilda, his wife and the two, John and Joe, and Joe was my father-in-law. So FJJ had grown up as one of eight boys. Can you imagine the testosterone going on in that house in, <laughs> in nearby Sandusky, Ohio? And by 1896 had moved to Hamilton, where he seemed to be settling in nicely, being at age 25, the general manager of the Cincinnati and Dayton Traction Company. That was an electric train system for the town. The, he was the Hamilton City Service Director and President of the Hamilton Ice and Cold Storage Company. That's by 25. <laughs> so um, Matilda was born and lived in Hamilton, Butler County, and her father, John Frederick, the name is familiar perhaps, and his family owned the Bender Brothers Construction Company, Hamilton's largest business. It was a construction company in the Yard. And on June 21, 1899, FJJ, age 28, married Matilda, age 27. And so the obvious research step was to examine Matilda and FJJ on the next census, one year later, 1900. Sure enough, there they were, living in Hamilton, Ohio, at 122 Buckeye Street, nice and near. <laughs> and shown as Frank Slow at age 29 and Spouse Matilda, age 27, listed as a railroad manager, and it looked like normal folks in a small Ohio town. And here's a picture that should be up now of the family taken at about, best I can figure, about 1905 or 6. And so there they are. There's FJJ and, uh, and his wife and the two children. And the little boy in the dress is my father in law. <laughs> and then a surprise. Looking yet again to the, in the 1900 Ohio census, I made a mistake by omitting the Ohio location from a query to look for FJJ in 1900. And up top, second census, different. It, it was enumerated a second time for 1900, but in a different location in Colorado, and not with Matilda. The 1900 census for Grand Junction, Mesa County, Colorado, there was a household that included Frank J.J. Slow, 29, and married, and John Bender, 51, and married. And the occupation of other persons living nearby indicated prospector is their occupation. Well, from 1900 records, I was able to identify the 51-year-old John Bell as Matilda's father, who was also a new age twice. So we did that. Although FJJ and Matilda married in June 1890, it appeared that his father-in-law and FJJ were prospecting the gold at least part of 1900. This was a stunning idea. I was lucky enough to know and love Matilda, my husband's grandmother, and she never impressed me as a wife who would put up with her husband's running off to Colorado to be a prospector with a few months of their marriage. So the discovery of this confirmed my sus suspicion that these Sloat and Bender men, and perhaps Matilda also, were risk-taking adventurers. 
It turned out the activities of both the Sloat and the Becker families were so intertwined that I had to expand my original plan of creating a timeline for FJJ Sloat's family to include the activities of various Bender family members too. So, the search for the adventurers and risk takers. This otherwise normal looking German small town of Ohio Sloat and Bender family members followed their dreams. Moving several times between Hamilton, Ohio and various California localities where there were indeed family related gold mines, uh, prune and grape farms, and between both California and Ohio, an amazing number of business enterprises running the gamut from mining and agriculture and real estate, uh, being pioneers in early 20th century implementation of city electric train systems, electric lighting and telephone systems, as well as establishing business for oil and water explanations, exploration, ice making, street paving, and eventually large scale dredging. If there was an opportunity, they took it. <laughs> And my goal, producing what eventually is becoming a narrative, as I described, uh, a narrative of the Slope Bender family timeline, is to unite and weave together the information from various sources to take <coughs> insight into their real lives. With the use of newspaper articles, uh, information was gathered that had not been available in family letters or local histories or government records. Sometimes it was very personal. There were several suicides often associated with very serious illnesses, and they recorded very graphically in these newspapers. And I justify documenting these because this timeline is intended for family members and not for the rest of the world. So although genealogists have been aware for years of the usefulness of newspapers as a source, the existence of several online databases now make researching much easier. For me, creating my slow vendor timeline has made not only possible, but exciting with the help of the subscription website, Newspapers Common, and there are many other sites where you can also go and get information. But small town newspapers, particularly in the Midwest, documented every activity for many of their inhabitants. They had gossip and who hosted the parties and their guest lists, who came, went visiting, and where and why, participation in school and sporting activities, and very important to me, the details of business and civic duties. Apparently, sleazy politics were not a rarity in Hamilton, Ohio, <laughs> but FJJ is frequently featured in newspaper articles as providing the truth behind false statements. <laughs> and I feel a whole lot better about him after reading that. <laughs> okay, so, so we've got the people that are really the <clears throat> key manners that I'm tracing now. One is FJJ, one is Rebecca Matilda, the two sons, and, and uh, Matilda's father. So let's set the stage for the Sloat and Bender adventurers in Nevada City, California, and Lamont near Gold. <coughs> so we should be seeing the essay office. Okay. The old essay office, there were would-be thieves that laid in the front of the essay office to rob people who were bringing their day's gold that they got out of the mines. And so um, that was a danger. Probably that essay office was probably built around the 1860s or 70s when the gold rush was on. We're talking around uh, the 1900s. It's still there. And here, there's a slide now of the boys. This is the two boys. The younger one on the left is my father-in-law, and that's his brother. So it's Joe and John. They're dressed in their give overalls, and they are carrying lunch pails. And that's important. They are standing at the door of the mine. And this is about 1912. So leave that one up a bit. It's my favorite one of all the stories I have, and I know those are boys. And here's a story, one of the stories from the, the, the now remaining um, grandchild. She said, husband John and I, and the kids, and I walked around the old assay office in the historic building in downtown Nevada City. Sure enough, there was a small back door where the boys took the lunch pails to have the gold weighed. And what they were doing was taking lunches up to the people working in the mine filling it with the gold that they'd gotten that day. And the boys were the deep boys walking with those pails to the essay office going in the back door. And they never got caught. They didn't lose anything. And she says, they were brave and inventive kids. Dad said running the lunches up to the mine was a breeze. It was coming back that was so hard. <laughs> Trying to swing those pails as if they were light and having to stop and rest frequently. So the gold is heavy. <laughs> And here's a second story from that that I also love. This is also from Diana. 
This is about the abandoned Chinese workers' compound. On one of their improvised trips with the lunch pails, the boys went through the abandoned Chinese workers' area, small houses on stilts along the riverbank. Uncle Joe picked up a gold watch and a couple of coins. Dad said, don't do that, and Joe took them anyway. They were off a dusty table with all the hands of cards laid down, eyeglasses left, all abandoned. Well, they got back to the house in late afternoon, and Joe took his stuff out of his pocket. Grandpa, that's FJ. FJ. Grandpa spotted and asked where he come from, and Joe told him. Grandpa was really upset. You go right back up there and put everything back exactly where you found it, and you apologize when you go in and when you leave. When the head of the clan dies, the ghost stays. <laughs> everything has to be left in place where there is big trouble. <laughs> It was getting to be dusk, and by the time they got into the house and put everything back, apologizing profusely, it was dark, and they were terrified, and then had to make their way home in the dark. Nothing bad happened, so if the ghost was there, it must have accepted Joe's apology. Dad was not happy to have to go back with him, but he sure wasn't going to let him do it alone. <laughs> okay, so the current stage of the timeline that I've been working on for a couple of years the basic timeline is nearly complete, and it validates my suspicion that Sloat family members were adventurers and risk takers. After the California activity, F.J. and his wife did the equivalent of going southeast, young man, to catch the Florida boom. One of the first jobs there was repaving the brick streets in Sarasota, which was at that time the winter quarters of the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. <laughs> Their last hurrah was building a dredge boat and beginning the long-term FJJ and Joe Slope family business dredging the Intercoastal Canal, finally winding down their lives and sliding to Louisiana. And I have just a sample of a couple of timeline pages, which we don't have time to really discuss, but it shows you a little bit how we have the date in one place and the source and then the things that are in it. Uh, both of these things provide information to someone who wants to go on and research the family because we have found keys to the next thing that isn't going to be me. I hope there will be another person that will be doing that. So, what's next, you say? For me, I'm going to create the front material that Ed described. It can be whatever I want it to be, but I'm thinking of doing some appendices on each one of the main families because I already know so much. I want to include it in this because when I send this to all the living descendants, I want them all to get that because someone else is going to have to pick up this thing and it's not going to be me. So it's opening it up to people. So it's a chance to put it in the back, not quite yet all the new <coughs> So I'm going to do that. And uh, let's see. And then I, the big thing, I have to create a distribution list of the names and addresses of all the linear descents. And there's a lot of pro people that are descended from the slow line and the bender line. So that's going to be a big thing. So that's what I'll be up to. And then for you, I suggest that you experiment with one of the many newspaper source sites to find something about one or several of your family members. These could provide not only entertainment, but amazingly useful clues as to their lives. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers. I know that there were some questions. Um, now's the time. Do you remember? I, I, yeah, I. I uh, oh, Andy and Shirley gave really good representations of the letters that they were able to find and, and to really interpret, decipher. Would be good for but when you wrote the book, Ed and Shirley, it, you, it's not just a recitation of what of the text in the letters, because yeah. that would be dull as dishwater. I mean, it wouldn't be dull as dishwater, but it, it's not as good as it could be done. Some of it is. Yeah. Right. So how, why, how did you, what was, was there a storyline that you built to, in between the family story that comes out automatically? Does it really? Yeah. Sure. Maybe. Part of your telling adventures with all the uh -huh. children. Yeah. Where everybody's traveling. That is something else. That is great. That is perfect. Thank you. A lot of information. And in one case, for mine, uh, you, you you decide who your main characters are. Uh -huh. and I identified five of them. So that's the ones I'm really tracing. So then I go to the newspaper things, 
and and you look through starting with a timeline and you can specify what time period you're talking about. And I printed off a whole bunch of those, a lot of which were inconsequential, but did it. And so I had a whole long list that hooked together everything. Right. And now what I'm doing is taking out the things that aren't adding to your understanding, but it's much easier to do that because you've got the outline that you're working with and you see how the family lived and when they moved and when they did these various things. So it's very useful to have too much information and then take it out right. in order to fashion. Well, thank you very much. My question is specifically for Ed, and you had said that you found one book that had a family collection of letters that told the family story. Was that Defend the Valley? Oh. You know, but the one I was just searching for. Yes. I don't remember. I guess you remember that it had okay. over 100 letters. Okay. Okay. Pretty, pretty there, there is a book that is was written by a member of the Barton family of Wheeler, Virginia. And the, the town, the Barton family lived there, and the town changed hands 30 some times during the Civil War. Sometimes while the Confederate soldiers were home visiting their families, and they had to sneak out through the graveyard walking their horses to get out of town without being nabbed by the Yankees. And if you have not read it, it is worth looking at. It's, they did a, this woman did a marvelous job. She collected letters from various members of the family, and they meshed. And one of the extended family members was reading through the letters before she sent them to this woman that was going to write the book and called the woman saying, I've got a letter signed by Mrs. Robert E. Lee saying she regrets that she can't come to the wedding. <laughs> and, and, you know, she, this woman had never looked at these letters before. So, it, it, you know, it's just really neat uh, reading the story and reading how it connected branches of the family that had totally lost touch with each other. Yes, and I have a question about preparing the letters. You refolded the letters. Yeah. As opposed to... Uh, leaving them flat, yeah. They were so crimped and that's, it was less strain on the letters okay. to leave back. Yeah, I, I had a choice on that. And I've, seen, I've seen letters all flattened out, but uh, that's difficult to do. You were trying to preserve the integrity of what you had. If you scan it, you don't need to. You don't need to open the letter again if you get a good scan. But okay. With the scan, I end up getting a piece of, of a fairly heavy glass. It was a three sixteenths of a broker. It was putting a knob on it to press the letter down a little bit because it all had creases that stood mm -hmm. up. Uh, and it was really <coughs> scan to do it. Just not, you're not mashing it down all the way, but you're kind of flattening the letter okay. out a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I also have yes. a question for Ed. How did you handle? Possible lack of punctuation. That's <laughs> 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 well, that's, that's an excellent question. As a matter of fact, we tried to leave the language like it was written, and even though I leave it to the front, occasionally you had to kind of translate it to, to the modern day. But the, no, we we didn't make us. We were smart enough to change our spelling and stuff. Did you add periods where there wasn't a period? That kind of thing. <laughs> uh, it was kind of mixed up on that. One. But the spelling we agreed ahead of time to leave spelling because okay. that's part of the that's part of the language. Yeah. It's kind of like you're writing the book; you get to make the decisions. You need to make clear what your assumptions have been. Well, that's taking information out of the letter instead of putting it in. I've got one more question in the back. Actually, it's the room. Is <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the store in Garland where you're getting your, awesome. your photos and tapes transferred. I love the name of that. Garland camera. Garland, just Garland. Garland, Garland camera. camera. They're located on the, on Shiloh, Shiloh and Northwest Highway. They're a real nice outfit. They are. Yeah. They're yeah. very I, I didn't nice. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. that. I, I've I have a question that has to do with, uh, again, about hearing the people's stories and things like that. And I came to a presentation at the BGS about StoryCorps app yes. and who is using that and uh, with their family and is anybody, you know, how have you been using it? Have you had good luck or 
on Story Code. Story Code. Without uploading, you know, to the National Library. It's just as a, your personal use. Well, I all I know is that StoryCorps is oh that's such a wonderful and they have this this huge grant that's been given to the government for that. Um, I haven't used it myself, but in in, uh, in watching the videos on there, they're so precious because the voices are of the real people, and then they have these little cartoon figures doing the acting out. But I, I haven't, I haven't tried to download it. I haven't used it myself, but I'm like you. I've taken videos and tried to get yeah. some story children engaged. It's, it's like I'm thinking if it's on the iPhone, I can get them into it. You know? <laughs> yeah, uh, so I just wondered if anybody had been using that application. So, and then my other question, this is a quickie for you, is um, what company do you use to purchase your um, archival uh, storage? You know, sleeves and papers and things like that. Or do you have a special one that you buy? Good prices, etc. There's an LDS bookstore. There's an LDS bookstore that's located on. A, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to jump in. Uh, the LDS bookstore is located on, um, I believe that's Motley uh, in Dallas, in the Dallas area. Um, I don't know what the corner is, but it's way out there. That uh, but Latter Day Saints, yes. There used to be one on LBJ at Preston. No, it's 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 right next to yeah. Okay. That is Preston. The that LBS. is Preston. Yeah, that's no, Preston and Motley. Yeah, I can't remember. It used to be oh, over on there. Forest at Preston, but then it moved no. over. To it's on. You're right. It's on Preston. It's on Preston. So that's it. LBS books for that. They have those kinds of no, I don't yeah. know. I don't know about the yes. Yeah. Yeah. Where does the library get theirs? I, I do have a lot of stuff that I'm trying to deal with. Old letters, like you said. And, uh, at this point, you know, I'm just kind of keeping up away from the air um, and, and trying the, to figure out what to do. Some of the main vendors um, are Road Art. Uh, Road Art. Can you spell that? Uh, B R O. D-A-R-T. And um, Gaylord. .com. Yes. And um, Gaylord. Um, also the archival supplies. Those are kind of the main uh, larger companies. Yes. That do it. And we have one more question. I don't know if you can use the college YouTube plan. There's, yeah, there's the, a lot of the community too. colleges do. Brookhaven Winston College and Eastland. Eastland. Goes to Eastland. Yeah. 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 And maybe others. Yeah. 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 East Eastfield. 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 Yeah, Eastfield. And Brookhaven. It's like they do it by trade or something like that. No. It's in your phone. Ask this gentleman sitting over there. He's going to be teaching some. He teaches it. He'll hear it again. By, by the way, I don't know if y'all are aware of this, but uh, for senior citizens, they uh, they offer free college. You can take college free, and at some colleges, so just check into that before you put any money down, because you might be able to just go. You don't get college credit, but you know, yeah, you just get one and take class. But but you also don't have to take the test. Yeah, you can if you want to, but you're not going for a great <laughs> between lifelong learning courses mm -hmm. and okay. the college courses so that you're talking is that right are you asking me or are you talking no i mean there's oh. a difference there. okay so, oh, yes. in terms of what you can take for college courses great yes um, i just want to say that and i really love hearing you speak it um terry merriman was my grandfather and he was away um recently but it's just so special to see some people that's so happy. Thank you. Thank you. She's one of my favorite girls in the whole world. Let's see. Thank you all so much for coming out. Thank you. Thank you.